let me start by asking you, do you think that um, quantum physics is difficult to understand? Well, after I, I wrote my first book, um, Divine Reality, people used to come, lots of people used to come to me and say, but Dr. Schaefer, your book is very difficult to read. So I said to them usually, you know, don't worry about it because for everybody who has a problem with the English language, I have a, a Russian translation. <laughs> Try that one. <laughs> now, uh, the, the new book really is different and it has a reason because when Deepak Chopra invited me to write it, he said, okay, um, I will publish anything you write, but you have a choice. You can write like you always did, and then nobody will read it. <laughs> or I will show you how you can write abstract things in such a way that they are easy to understand. And he did. It, it, it's incredible. He spent weeks to show me until something clicked. So, <laughs> so the result is this book. And for example, my wife, who is not a physicist, most of her life she has been a teacher of handicapped children. She has read it several times, and she says she understands everything. And actually, I also get a lot of email where people say that. So um, let's see what we have here. Quantum phenomena, yeah, they are not difficult, you, you see from this story. But you might say, why should I get involved anyway? Um, because, yeah, why should you be involved? You can say, I'm not a quantum physicist, I'm not a physicist, I couldn't care less. And I would say that to find happiness in life, um, you have to live in harmony with the order of the universe. For that, you have to understand what this order is like. And the difficulty is, you have to go behind the visible surface of things. And here is where quantum physics can help us. So, or just, you know, in a very short form, the quantum phenomena show us that there is a part of the world we can't see. It doesn't consist of things, but of forms. The forms are mind-like. Um, they have the character of a wholeness. It is possible that they indicate the existence of a cosmic mind that is connected with our mind. The visible world is Maya. It's a, it's a system of tricky deceptions, like the commercials of a big company or the statements of a government. Not our government, excuse me. I did not say that, okay? So, so the visible world, it instructs us, and at the same time, it deceives us. You have to be smart not to fall for its tricks. And to some extent, the classical physicists, the European scientists, they weren't smart. Since, since Newton, they always told us that we have to look at the visible surface of things to understand the world. But that's dangerous. You can make, make your own test, like um, look around you, what do you see? You see things, you see solid stuff, you see something that fills space. Um, it's enduring. So, Newton was right when he said, God in the beginning formed matter in solid, massy, hard, impenetrable particles, so very hard, never to wear or break in pieces. They're eternal. Uh, as it turns out, they're not eternal. Um, elementary particles, electrons, atoms, when they are on their own in a vacuum, like in a in an ordinary vacuum, 
they vanish. They stop being material particles, they become waves. They vanish from the empirical world. As waves, they lose all mass. They have no specific position in space. They are, as a matter of fact, not anymore a part of the empirical world. Out of this state, they can pop out again, but that's not a process we can control. So I made you, made you this slide that says, <clears throat> well, when you look here, yeah. can I? No. Ah, uh, here is, no? Can I go back? No, I can't go back. How can I go back to this? Huh? It doesn't work. It only goes forward. <laughs> huh? It's going back? Oh, okay, okay. Where's this? Yeah, here it is. So let's see, is this? Yeah. So, you know, when you look at it, it's a dot. Um, it's an actual thing. It's empirical. When you leave it alone, it becomes a wave. It's non empirical. It is in a state of potentiality. It has the potential to become real again. So, um, when you interact with a wave, it becomes a dot. Leave the dot alone, it becomes a wave. That's how simple that is. Okay. This is a special instrument. It's actually an electron diffraction instrument. It was designed and constructed by researchers in my research group in the 80s of the last century. Uh, I hesitate to... <laughs> um, I do not appreciate people asking me, last century or... The... <laughs> okay. It was actually a very special instrument because it was the first one in which the electrons were observed electronically rather than photographically, which is kind of clumsy. And it made possible new types of experiments, time-resolved electron diffraction of laser-excited molecules. Yeah, to just mention it for a nice memory, and here is some old drawings that are found when we designed this instrument. So, when an electron enters such an instrument, it becomes a wave. You can see the wave nature by the way in which the electron interacts with molecules. These are all data. So these are real things. You see the wave nature. Okay, and um, well, in, in the book, in this infinite potential, I've suggested not to speak of particles and so on, but of entities. So you can, you can abbreviate entity as ET, uh, entity. But that fits because entities appear to us as elementary things when we see them, ET, or as elementary thoughts when we leave them alone. Yes, because the forms that they become, they are thought-like. It's like there is an invisible, it suggests there is an invisible realm of thoughts. Okay, uh, C. N. Villars is a British physicist. He said something like this, that being wave or being particle are different states of these things. So he didn't use ETs, but being a particle is a state, being a wave is a state. Being visible is one state, not visible is the other one. Being thought-like, you know, this is the direction we are going to take. So, potentiality waves, they are invisible forms, they are patterns of information, they are thought-like. How, how crazy, I mean, we're talking 
getting ideas out of physics about something that is real and thought-like, not thought in part of a com complicated structure, but existing in its own right. Um, visible, act visible actuality and invisible potentiality. The visible world, everything you see, is an emanation out of a realm of forms, out of a realm of thoughts. And not only thoughts in our mind, but general realm of thoughts. So, um, yeah, you know, that's fascinating, but I have talked about it before, but our language, for some reason, there is an interest in washing our brain. It doesn't want us to think in a neutral way, but in a, in a loaded way. Like, what do you say when, when, when something is unimportant? Tell me something. It doesn't matter. doesn't matter. If it isn't matter, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Where does that come from? You know? Um, what do you say when, when, okay, here's water in it, if I pour it out, it's empty. What would you say when you say it's empty? Nothing there. there is nothing there, no thing there. What if you have a container and it has no things, but it is filled with invisible forms? It's not nothing, <laughs> but you say it's nothing because, so, you know, we have many of these. Um, yeah, I don't want to spend too much time. I talked about it before, but reality has a, a, a Latin root. It's res, things. Things are real. We have no, in the English language, we have no other word for reality. I, I may be wrong, so if you find one, I'd be happy to know. In contrast, in the German language, there are two words. One is the same, realität, reality, comes from race, things. The other one is Wirklichkeit. It comes from a word, wirken, meaning acting. If it can act on you, whether it's matter or not, doesn't matter, it's real. And so, you know, you have two different languages, and I think there's a connection, like the English language wants us to be a materialist, and some of the most powerful formulations of materialism were invented in the English language range, namely Newton's physics, it's powerful, look at all the incredible consequences, Darwin's biology, materialism, and the banking system, well, okay. <laughs> At the same time, you know, you, you grow up speaking German, you have some other language. Some of the most powerful formulations of idealism came out of the German language range. The 19th century idealist philosophers, Hegel and all these people, and quantum physics. Quantum physics is a form of idealism. It, started in Germany. So, you know, maybe someday we should, we should sit down and look at our language and say, or oh, oh, this example, that doesn't make sense. What, what do you mean when you say it doesn't make sense? I mean, it's stupid. Because it's not in your senses? It's stupid? No. You know, quantum physics says, our life is ruled by a world that is nonsense, meaning it is not in our senses. So, um, maybe sometime we should take a systematic look at all our words and say, what are they trying to make us think? What kind of brainwash are they trying to do? It's, you know, it's again like commercials. Well, Newton's materialism, of course, you know, you, you can criticize in many ways, but it was, 
immensely important. Think of all the technological advances that came of it. So people copied it. Darwin entered it into biology. Having or not having stuff became the essence of life. Nothing else counts. Anything ideal is just a pretense to get more stuff. And with this, greed and aggression, let's face it, they are our public virtues. No, we want to be. No. What do fathers tell their sons? Son, you have to go out and let them have it. So um, you see how it is important? Because I think you know, we should change it. Um, you see also from that, many people are amazed, worldview affects way of life. Even, even in, in the general public, where people say, I have nothing to do with science, but yes, you have to, because your life is in an unnoticeable way affected by what science thinks about the world. So when that changes, like it is now, we should know about it and actively change our way of life. Um, in the quantum world, things are interconnected. The universe is a holistic system. In a holistic, in a holistic world, greed and aggression make no sense. If we are all connected, if I cheat you, basically I cheat myself. There may be a, a momentary advantage, but you can see it, people who live like this, when they get older, they are paying a price. You can see it from that. So, um, yeah, we should, we should accept mutual support, love. It's an abused word, but we should, you know, take it seriously. Cooperation. Well, um, unexpected side effect. Yes, there's an unexpected side effect. If there is <clears throat> a part of the world that we cannot see, physics has discovered this part. Then physics has discovered that it cannot describe the world. But that has always been the the commercial of science, we describe what the world is like. Now we say, uh-uh, you cannot. The basis is, cannot be described. So there are limits to what we can know, and we depend on this basis. All right. Um, yeah. Aspects of non-empirical, non-material, invisible, invisible uh, order come in many phenomena to the fore. In simple ways, for example, in atoms, in Schrodinger's quantum mechanics, the electrons in atoms, they are not things. It's, it's the same way when we see an electron, it's a particle. If you get one out of the power line, it's a particle. It has a mass. When you don't see it, when it is in an, in an atom, it is not a particle. It's a form. It's a waveform. Schrodinger's waves do not have units of matter, of mass. They have, they're just numbers. They're patterns of information. And yet, the entire visible order of the world is determined by how these waves interact. The electron waves of atoms make molecules. The electron waves in molecules show how molecules interact, like in your body, and keep you alive. We depend on non-material waves. So, yeah, there are empty forms, Schrodinger's waves, numbers. They don't have units of mass or energy. Max Born, another pioneer of quantum physics, he said, they are probability waves. So, why are there probability waves? Whenever you interact with such waves, a particle will pop out somewhere, and the waveform tells you the probabilities where it will pop out. It may pop out here or there, or there. 
So there are probability waves, and um, there are numbers. Materialism is wrong. At the basis, we find non-material things. There's a very fascinating phenomenon, you probably know more about it than I do, perennial philosophy. There are truths that are so deep that they constantly come back again and again over thousands of years in different parts of the world, in different people, different minds, perennial philosophy. It's actually you know, related to one of our topics here today, that there is something like this perennial philosophy. It shows that there is a cosmic realm of ideas and we are connected with it. Our minds are connected with it. We have to think then they're also connected with each other. So the universe is conscious. Do I dare to say that? It, more and more, you, you are forced to say it. So, the idea that all things are numbers is such a, a concept of perennial philosophy because Pythagoras, 6th century BC, he already said all things are numbers. He actually is verbatim. <laughs> he said the harmony of the cosmos is based on the ratios of numbers. Nicolas da Cusa, end of middle age German uh, monk, he said, number was the first model of things in the creator's mind. And Plato, he said, real things aren't things, they're forms, they're ideas. All the same ideas. The annual philosophy, when you, when you look at how the ideas come back, you will find out that they don't come back exactly like, but they evolve. There is an evolution of ideas, like um, that things are forms. Yes, you find it in quantum physics, you find it in Greek philosophy, but the way it appears in quantum physics has many implications that the Greek, the Greek forms did not have like, you know, the, the waveforms of electrons, the, the basis of, of all our electronics and so on. So, ideas evolve, and um, it, it led me to the idea that the evolution of life is not the adaptation of bodies to their environment, which is Darwinian definition, but it's the adaptation of our mind to increasingly complex forms in the cosmic realm of forms. The, the two views are not in conflict because the external world and the ideas in us, they come out of the same source. So, if you understand one, you understand the other. In fact, if I, if I understand that right, we do not understand the external world because we have experiences, but there's already something in us that, that helps us to understand them. So, the forms, all right. Um, yeah, non-empirical, you know, we talk non-empirical world, it's not just, you find it everywhere. I mean, there are many examples. For example, atoms, molecules, they exist in quantum states. The word comes from, you can think of a ladder of energy. Each, each step represents a quantum of energy. It's a quantum state. So, this, the simplest case for the hydrogen atom. Um, the, you know, the details don't matter here right now. The three numbers are quantum numbers. They determine the energy level of a state. And each state is also characterized by a waveform, a wave function that determines its physical character. So, 
here's the thing. When an atom exists in this, it's actually the ground state, the lowest energy state, then if you make repeated observations, the form of that state will come out. You can see, oh yeah, it's a, it's a sphere. When it is in that state, the others also exist, but you can't see them because they are empty, they are empty states. The molecule is in one of these states, the others are empty, their forms exist as a logical order, but it's invisible. But it's real because it's there and because if the system jumps into one of these states, let's say from here to here, all of a sudden it looks like a donut. <coughs> and then the first one is gone. That's the idea of empty or virtual states, a virtual order that is inherent in the visible reality, but we can't see it. It's a virtual order, but it's real. How am I doing with this? Is this okay? Yeah, it's, it's somewhat abstract. You know, I may go on and say, oh my God, I lost you half an hour ago. Well, <laughs> we might as well all go have a beer or something. <laughs> So, okay, um, <clears throat> virtual states, um, they are not a part of the empirical world, you can't see them, but they have potential, you see, it's again an element of potentiality, they can become visible, all right? So, <clears throat> non-empirical entities the realm of potentiality, if you think about it, they are an embarrassment in science. Five minutes? What does that mean, five minutes? <laughs> Can somebody take that lady and you? <laughs> um, wait a second. I started at 20 past. You said I have 45 minutes, that's 20, 50, five past, okay. <laughs> so, 50 more minutes. Yeah, okay, <laughs> then embarrassment. Um, so, you know, the pioneers, they, they tried to explain in a way. Niels Bohr said, well, don't worry about it. Our experience of the world means nothing. It's of our experience, not of the world. And whose idea is it? So Kant, Kant's idea. And Einstein said, well, um, there's something wrong with quantum physics. I mean, he realized it did a lot of, he said, it's incomplete. And I've said that before. It's a great pleasure to, to correct a, a giant in science like this. <laughs> because what I believe is, that it is not the theory that is incomplete, it's the visible reality that is incomplete. It doesn't tell us anything about the non-visible realm. So, did I talk that long? Or did <laughs> when did we start? You are, oh, no, no, no. I came here at 20, and then you fixed around with the computer for five minutes. Man, <laughs> that means 25 and 30 is five. So, 10 past, 10 past, fine. <laughs> I go for that. <laughs> so, six. huh? 10 past 6. 10 past 6. Um, you don't need another what is that? That's, that's not central time, that's... Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> okay, I have... So, you know, um, right, <laughs> non-dual, non-dual time. So, um, I, I jump this so that we, we get the essential part. Molecules are guided in their actions by the waveforms of empty states, virtual states, like by inner images. That term, inner images, comes out of psychology. Gerald Hüther, German psychiatrist, he has defined inner images, all that which is hidden behind the visible surface of living beings and steers their actions. So in chemistry, a molecule does nothing that isn't 
allowed by a waveform, an inner image of one of its quantum states. In life, a human being does nothing that isn't allowed by an inner image of the mind. There is an equivalence of the mental and the physical. We see it again and again. Quantum physics is the psychology of the universe. Psychology is the physics of the mind. So, um, I want to point out that the same sort of ideas appeared in Carl Gustav Jung's psychology, where, we, where our mind depends on forms that exist in some realm of forms. And as Jung described it, the, the collective unconscious is a psychic system of a collective, universal, and impersonal nature, which is identical in all individuals. And you could say about the quantum world, the invisible background of the universe, the quantum world, is a psychic system of a collective, universal, and impersonal nature. Same thing. So, um, virtual, virtual wave functions are like archetypes. And Jung said something like this himself. He says, it is not only possible but fairly probable even that psyche and matter are two different aspects of one and the same thing. Okay, I wouldn't say thing, but it's fine. <laughs> there are so many things, but we can't talk about it. Like the aspect of wholeness comes out. Like when Jung said, you know, in this realm of forms, I'm indivisibly this and that. I am, I experience the other in myself and the other than myself experiences me. So the proposal is that the non-empirical reality that Jung discovered, the non-empirical reality that the quantum phenomena reveal, all are one and the same medium of spirit, a realm of wholeness, where science, psychology, philosophy and religion are one. Um, in Western science, these things may be scandalous, but how about we are undergoing a mutation? How about that these changes signalize that there's a new human species evolving? So have courage, take a leap into a, into a spiritual mind. So at this point you must say, okay, now I need to know what is the definition of a spiritual mind. It is a mind that can seek for truth in an invisible part of the world, non-empirical part. And um, you could say, well, can you prove to me that, that my mind is a spiritual mind? And then I must say, what do you mean prove? You can't measure the temperature and say, okay, that guy is not connected, that guy is connected. That doesn't work. There's no such thing. Um, the proof is in you. You have to prove it for yourself. You need a personal experience that can show you that your mind is connected. And I can share with you such an experience don't get afraid, I'm not going off the deep end now. <laughs> but, but I have such an experience that minds are connected because I realized a few years ago that the ideas that I talk about now, I have for 10 years, about quantum physics, they were in me when I was a, a, growing up and young man. And I didn't even know about quantum physics. I didn't know about all these things. But they were in me in some tacit form. And I can show you why. I painted them. And, um, for example, the idea that the cosmic spirit is thinking in us. When I was 20, and maybe till 30, I painted, I painted myself always. The universe was in crazy. 
Why did I do that? You could say you shouldn't have done it. Yeah, okay, <laughs> fine. Um, so, you know, this is one example. The other example, you know from Kashmir Shaivism, the universe is filled with waves, panda, and everything comes out of it. When I was young, I was fascinated by waves. I loved the ocean. I still love the ocean. That's why I live in Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I, started, I started to paint <laughs> waves. And every time when I painted waves, they came out of the sky. I had no idea what I was doing. But there are many of these things. It's the boat is like a symbol for our voyage through Spanna towards the light. And there was a time when I thought these things were beautiful. I still do. <laughs> um, yeah, the waves can be rough, you know. And when I was around 30, I stopped. And I, I didn't even, my wife kept them. And recently I discovered this, and she pulled out one after another, and I said, who did that one? Where did that come from? <laughs> you see, there's always the boat, symbol for us, sailing towards the light. So, um, if you don't mind, I still think they are beautiful. There is something in... I, I started 15 minutes late. You know what that means? So, I thought I'd show those to you. <laughs> and, well... Um, Look at this one, I mean, <laughs> sailing, you know, the, all right. So that's one topic. Then, you know, another one, um, to be creative in this life, you have to go behind the visible surface of things. If you are a flower and you want to bloom, you have to leave your pot. I painted that too. So, okay, just a few more minutes. Um, well, why am I even talking? I have five minutes. So, quantum theory is a form of mysticism, rational mysticism. Mysticism, uh, an ancient method to explore the world. When you read the text of mystics, they always discovered something about the world, like Plotinus when he wrote, often when I wake up out of my body to myself and step out of myself, I behold the most beautiful beauty. And then he understands the order of the world. In the 17th century, a student asked Jakob Böhme how he could find God, and Böhme, the 17th century Lutheran mystic, he said, Son, when you, when you can throw yourself into that in which no creature dwells, then you shall hear what God says. And then the student said, Well, where is this that? Where I can hear all that. Is it close or away? The master said, It is in you, my son. God hears and sees through you, speaks in you, and whispers to your to your spirit, and your spirit hears his voice. How can you be sure that your mind is a spiritual mind? Because deep inside it, you can hear that the cosmic spirit is whispering in you. Bajavid Bestami was a 9th century Muslim mystic. He wrote, for 30 years I went about searching for God. When, at the end of this time, I opened my eyes, I discovered that it was God who was searching for me. Your inner potential is like this. You may search for it all your life, 
someday you'll find that it is searching for you. And when that happens, <clears throat> the ideas will begin to flow into your mind, which has become a spiritual mind. I end, this is my last slide, the last sentences of my, my book, behind the visible surface of things is an ocean of possibilities. It defines your inner potential. Its waves are playful, play a game of hide and seek with you, all the time hoping that you will catch one and turn it into a beautiful poem, a painting, a song, or a wonderful act of human kindness. Good books need good friends. <laughs>